Good evening, and welcome to Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where we have three astronauts and one cosmonaut suiting up for their journey to the International Space Station in just about four hours. We are partnering with SpaceX for their ride as part of NASA's commercial crew program. And as we count down to liftoff at 11, 16, and 12 seconds Eastern time, we're gonna bring you all the action live and in 4K. I'm NASA's Megan Cruz, and this is the official launch broadcast of Crew 8's launch. And with me to help commentate to what's happening tonight is NASA astronaut Rajachari. Well, great hey, to man. have you here. Yeah, thanks, Megan. It's excited to be here uh, a year after I got to do this uh, for Crew 6. I'm happy to be back. Yeah, this is the one-year anniversary of the Crew 6 launch. And Raja is, of course, talking about when he did get to co-host that uh, broadcast with us. And it was also your first launch from the ground. Yes, it was. Yeah, first time seeing a launch. My, my first launch was on the rocket. And then the first time I got to watch one was uh, a year ago. And uh, getting excited to see uh, Crew 8 hopefully head to the ISS this evening. And right now we are inside the suit-up room. We have a shot of Commander Matt Dominic as well as pilot Michael Barrett, and they are in the process of suiting up. We'll talk you through all of what's happening in this room here, but I do just want to give you guys a little quick background on Raja. He was the commander of NASA's SpaceX Crew-3 mission, which launched back in November 2021. We have video of that right now. Once aboard the space station, he served as a flight engineer and conducted science experiments and technology demonstrations. He also performed two spacewalks, and then after 177 days in orbit, he and his crew splashed down off the coast of Tampa, Florida. And then as we were saying, this is video exactly one year ago today, <laughs> Raja watching his first launch from the ground while co-hosting our Crew 6 launch broadcast. And also speaking of anniversaries, it's also five years to the day since Demo 1 launched, which was the first uncrewed test flight of SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft to the International Station and now, uh, Space Station. And now here we are with Crew 8, Raja. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, there, uh, there's a saying, I don't know who to attribute to, but uh, you know, seem, things seem impossible until they're common. And here we are, like you said, five years later uh, from what seemed impossible with Demo-1 returning U.S. Uh, astronauts to, from a U.S. launch vehicle on U.S. soil. And, and now we're on the fifth flight of this vehicle and Crew-8. It's just, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, fifth flight of Dragon Endeavor, which when we got a shot of the launch pad, we will show you that spacecraft there, the flight leader so far. There it is, actually. We have it pulled up on the screen for you. We are looking at a brand new Falcon 9 booster on launch pad 39A here at Kennedy Space Center. And at the very tippy top there, we have Dragon Endeavor. And it's a beautiful, a beautiful night, beautiful view here at the Cape. It's always, always great to come down here, even when you're battling mosquitoes, to, to get to see the launch in we person. Are. We are. We are fighting some mosquitoes out here on the hostess. You'll notice, actually, that this is audio-only commentary right now, but we will expand our coverage later, uh, where we will introduce other commentators uh, at NASA and at SpaceX, and we will also come on camera to join you for that last hour before liftoff. I saw the visors just go down there, so they're checking the, the suit seals now. Um, you can actually see the view there. You can see uh, Alexander's hands extended there as the suit pressurizes, right? Actually, I think that's Matt's. Um, and you can see how the helmet goes up higher as it pressurizes, and there, it, looks like, it looks like they're shrinking, but it's just the, uh, the helmet extending as it pressurizes. Mm -hmm. And right now we've been focusing on uh, these two, Matt and Mike, but just across from them are Jeanette and Alexander. Alexander. Exactly, yep. And they basically do them in groups of two. Um, and they have a set of, uh, this is basically to check all the seals on the suit before they actually head out to the pad. Um, and they do it here. This is the same place uh, they've been suiting up since Follow. <laughs> Got a quick look for a vat there yeah. um, uh, for the camera. Uh, they've been doing this uh, for decades. Uh, this is the historic room. Um, and we do it here because it's uh, much better to find a problem with the suit in this room where you have all the equipment than it is to have it that problem on the pad. Because they will do leak checks on the pad in the rocket as well. And the seats they're in configured the same way that they're going to be in Dragon, right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Those are the, the basically the same kind of design. You can see uh, Jeanette's even further <laughs> sucked out there. Oh. Um, 
can barely see or just the eyes. Right, in a microgravity, <laughs> it's not a big deal, right? Because if you're pressurizing the suit, you can move around pretty quickly. So, you're, But in 1G, you kind of slump down as the suit grows around you. But um, the whole point of it being pressurized is to provide you your own little mini spaceship on the inside if there were any problems with the, with the vehicle. Yeah, these suits are specifically for when they're inside Dragon and uh, we're pressure checking these suits again because if something were to happen, you know, this needs to sustain them. Exactly, yeah. We call them IV or in-vehicle suits as opposed to EVA suits, which are when people talk about spacewalks, those are different types of suits. But you're exactly right, Megan. These are the ones um, that basically provide the crew both cooling, protection, uh, oxygen, air right, while they're in the vehicle. One with the delayed T minus four hour situational awareness briefing. We're currently counting down to a T zero of 04 16 13 UTC or 23 16 13 local with an instantaneous window. The crew has started suit donning and leak checks in preparation for ingress activities. The advanced team is currently on the way to the pad to open the side hatch and prepare for crew arrival. Vehicle gases are at MEOP, FTS checkouts are complete, and Dragon prop tanks are pressed. Falcon 9 is not working any issues at this time. The team is evaluating elevated ascent weather criteria and will make the final determination no later than L-1 hour. Launch weather will be closely monitored with a POV now adjusted to 40%. Falcon 9 launch and recovery weather is not tracking any constraints this time. In the event of a scrub, the next available launch opportunity will be March 3rd. Procedure 52.91 is open in the event of a crew contingency through crew ingress and launch. As a reminder, the launch escape system will be armed prior to propellant load today. Hangar X will go into lockdown at T-minus 45 minutes and last until spacecraft separation or until after the LES is disarmed and all personnel requested to stay in their locations until lockdown is complete. CE, do you have a report on Falcon 9 help? Um, Falcon 9 is tracking one issue on a TBC air break, uh, the failed uh, checkouts for MVAC, but we are working the issue and are go to proceed. Copy all. CE. Uh, MD, the report on Dragon Health. Dragon is healthy at this time. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we have some rationale we're putting together for a watch item for an MD call LCC, but no concern at this time. Copy all. And this will conclude the T minus 4 hour situation awareness briefing, unless there are any other questions. All right, so as you just heard over our mission audio loops, that was the T-minus four hour situational briefing. Um, you'll notice that we paused for that briefing uh, just th so we can give you guys uh, uh, an, some insight into how the count is going and so far working no issues. The launch time has adjusted though by one second, so 11, 16, and 13 seconds Eastern time. And Raja, we heard working no issues. Yep, yeah, you heard them say the Dragon prop tanks are pressurized, so that's the, the tanks inside the vehicle as opposed to the F9 tanks, which they'll do later when they're on the pad when they actually start propellant loading. Um, and yeah, as you heard about 40% uh, probability of violation uh, for launch, which is what they're obviously the biggest thing we're tracking this evening for the window. You see they're unstrapped and uh, up uh, in the, out of the seats, which means it looks like the leak checks passed. Um, so now they basically will start uh, getting ready to, to head out. Um, they're going to button up the suits there. Um, there's some Velcro uh, they, um, attach points that basically just make it a little more comfortable um, not, so now that they're done kind of in and out of them. Um, you can see the, we call them the ninjas. Um, so you got the iPad there. So all these procedures are basically going step by step and then each group of two has a suit team working with them that's kind of running through the procedures and making sure that they're, everything is good to go. Right. And they're on the umbilicals now. So those Alexander's holding that cooling unit. So that's what's providing them cooling right now the little mobile unit until they get into the spacecraft. Yeah, we have uh, Alexander. Oh, no, actually now we have a Jeanette. shot of Jeanette there. Again, as you said, adjusting those Velcros. And I do want to very quickly say 40% go. Oh, sorry. 60%. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yep. No, no Thanks. problem. No problem. That was a quick brief. <laughs> a lot to absorb. <laughs> All right, and now we have a shot of Commander Matt Dominic, and let's tell you a little bit more about him now. So Matt was born and raised in Wheat Ridge, Colorado, married to Faith Dominic, and they have two daughters. Matt earned a Master of Science degree in Systems Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School, and he was designated as a Naval Aviator in 2007. He made two deployments to the North Arabian Sea, flying close air support missions in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. He has more than 1,600 hours of flight time in 28 different aircraft, 
400 carrier arrested landings and 61 combat missions. This will be his first spaceflight, Raja. Yes, indeed. And uh, probably mo most importantly, that's not in that uh, bio, is Matt's uh, also one of the 2017 class turtles. So he will keep our tradition of uh, having a turtle on the space station going strong. Um, so, yeah, Matt and I train together, and he's a, a great, uh, just hilarious person. Um, very humorous, but also um, completely serious and super competent, and uh, super excited to get to see him head up uh, with Crew 8. Yeah, of course you would mention that he's a turtle, <laughs> fellow <laughs> turtle. It's a very proud class, astronaut class. <laughs> All right, now we have Dr. Michael Barrett. He's seated right next to Matt right there. He's going to be Crew 8's pilot, was selected by NASA in 2000. He's the only one of Crew 8 who's been to space before as part of Expedition 1920 in 2009 and STS-133 in 2011. In total, he's spent 212 days in space, and he is board certified in internal and aerospace medicine. He has been awarded numerous times for his contributions to space medicine research, and right now he lives in League City, Texas with his wife, Michelle, and they have five children. Personal and recreational interests include sailing, boat restoration, writing, and I need to ask you about this, Raja. Cooking good food <laughs> in harsh or remote places. He said austere places. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mike's, uh, Mike and Michelle are awesome family. Actually, Mike was my family uh, escort when we were down here mm. um, for our launch uh, and helping out with uh, the families. And he was also my mentor in uh, ASCAN training and just oh. a, a great human. Um, as you probably took from that bio, he's a little bit of everything, like <laughs> does his own boating, cooking in austere conditions. He is known to like to snack and have uh, always have <laughs> food ready to go. Um, but, uh, and he, I, I know we overuse the word literally, but he literally wrote the book on space medicine. Actually, it, it is a book that the, the actual text that they use to teach space flight medicine is, is edited by him. So he is the preeminent expert. Um, and so he gets used all the time, especially as we talk Artemis programs and development for all the medical considerations uh, as we look forward to exploration space flight. Wow. And he was heavily involved with commercial crew uh, for both SpaceX and Boeing and how they developed their the medical systems and responses. Wow, so he's a great person to have on this mission with three yeah. first-time flyers. Yeah, if you're, if you're going to get a cold, it's, you're going to do it with, <laughs> uh, with him on, on board. All right, now we see Jeanette Epps here, mission speci specialist, also again, her first space flight. The Syracuse, New York native was a NASA fellow during graduate school and then worked for Ford Motor Company, where, get this, she received a U.S. patent for her research into auto collisions and countermeasure systems. And then after leaving Ford, she joined the Central Intelligence Agency seven years as a technical intelligence officer, officer before becoming an astronaut in 2009. She has a Master of Science uh, and Doctorate of Philosophy in Aerospace Engineering, and she is also a twin. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I've gotten to fly with her, not in space, but the T-38 several times, so we've done some training events together. Um, I uh, would tell you what she did before she came to the Astronaut Corps, but I can't. Uh, <laughs> as, as you heard, she worked for the CIA, so, uh, <laughs> but it was obviously some cool things. Uh, but um, yeah, excited to see her get to fly. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, this is a really great crew, and it's been really fun to watch them in training. Uh, so usually in assigned flow training, they, they do most of the things together, but every once in a while, uh, people who aren't assigned with them will get to be parts of, like, sim support or things like that, and it's been fun to, to have that opportunity with Crew 8. Yeah, a really accomplished crew, uh, very diverse backgrounds. Yep. And finally, we have a shot here. Mission Specialist Alexandra Grubenkin, also, again, first-time flyer graduated from the Irkutsku Military Aerospace Engineering Institute in 2002, majoring in the engineering, maintenance, and repair of aircraft radio navigation systems. He then attended the Moscow Technical University of Communications and Informatics, graduating with a degree in radio communications, broadcasting, and television. He was accepted into the Cosmonaut Corps 2018, and will serve as flight engineer while on board the space station. Yeah, and yeah, as you mentioned, Alexander is in one of the, the newer classes of the cosmonauts, so it's great to see the continuing uh, cooperation. We've got uh, Laurel up there on the space station now, who flew up in a Soyuz. Alexander will head up there on, a, on the Dragon here the in, uh, this evening. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that, that partnership continues. We've got the crew's training in Russia and uh, the cosmonauts training here with us to, to fly on Dragon. So, Raja, talk us through what's happening here now, um, because it does seem like all of the pressure checks have happened on their suits, and they're connected to their umbilicals, which are connected to those blue boxes, like we said, providing air. Yep. 
Yeah, so right now, so there's generally some pad built into the timeline because had there been a, a leak or anything like that, you would have wanted time to fix that and not have to scrub the launch. So right now, since everything went well, you can see they've got some time. The reason they're in the chairs is when you're standing in the suits in 1G, um, you saw when it was pressurized, the helmet went up, but in 1G, the basically the weight of the suit is coming down on you and it actually mm. puts some pressure on the top of your head. Mm. So it can get uncomfortable after a while. And it is, it is, it sort of feels like you're wearing a, a suit that's too tight, um, but that's intentional because when it pressurizes, you don't, as you saw, their head sunk down, and if it wasn't tight, uh, you would not be able to see out of the helmet at all. And so that's why they're, they're sitting there, and they stay on the cooling because also it's just you can imagine wearing, you know, if you dress up for winter clothes, it gets hot if you're sure. staying inside. And so the less exertion they can have and staying on the cooling just kind of keeps their, their core body temps down um, so they don't wind up sweating. Uh, the folks you saw standing at the front of the room are kind of a mix of um, some of those are, uh, there's, there's the astronaut support person, there's the flight med, uh, you saw the deputy chief of the astronaut office, Shannon Walker, in there. Um, so basically uh, several people, all those folks have been in quarantine with the crew while they've been down here at Kennedy Space Center. Yeah, let's talk about the astronaut support person. So, as you said, everyone wearing a black ninja suit is a SpaceX employee, except for number 21, because number 21 is NASA astronaut Denise Burnham, and she's serving as the astronaut support person for this mission. She is, yeah. We call it, there the she acronym is. is the ASP. Yep. So, Denise is in the, in the new class, the FLIES, which are the, the class that will be graduating here in just a few days uh, back at Johnson Space Center. And so, typically, what the ASP does, they've, they've gone by different names. They're in the shuttle area, they're called C Cape Crusaders, but mm -hmm. it was a, a similar role. And, um, basically, they're the, I guess, eyes and ears of the crew because, as you can imagine, when the crew's down here in quarantine, they are going through final rehearsals, sims, uh, kind of events, and the ASP is kind of going, th like, tracking vehicle status. Uh, she'll go out to the pad with them this, this evening. Um, you know, the, the probably the most public thing you'll see her do is help dial the phone numbers for the calls <laughs> the astronauts make on the launch pad, but there's a whole lot more besides that. That's just what you happen to see on TV. So most of it is, um, you know, working as there's changes in the schedule, sleep shifting, and coordinating with the rest of the sport team. And it's really an opportunity. Like that person is, like I said, kind of the, the crew rep when the crew can't be at everything that's going on when they're down here in quarantine. Yeah. A nice big smile from pilot Mike Barrett there. Yeah, so this is kind of a, a relaxing time uh, just to, yeah, everything up to this point has, has been really go, go, go um, and very, very scripted. So it's nice when things are going well and you actually have a minute or two just to sit and take in the moment. You can what? see the patches there underneath. Uh, Kuwait's added their patch to the uh, the suit checkout station there. So on all the stations, they have all the, the USCV patches that have been checked out in that suit room. And it looks like they're getting right ahead out. As they get up, I have a question for you. Yeah. You know, how long do they train together as a crew? So it's about 18 to 24 months. It kind of just depends on the flow. In a perfect world, it would be 24 months. Um, it, sometimes it just takes a little longer to actually um, have the crews named and all and get working together but you can see some of the shots here that's uh that's the seda chamber where they actually practice going to vacuum and you can see jeanette and mike are there working uh, and getting actual hands-on practice with matt so pretty much it's not just iss training what you're seeing here but you saw them getting the t-38 together doing the suit training so all of that is happening as a crew as early and as long as you can yeah it's so important to obviously go through the training that you need but also that camaraderie right and there's so much that happens from training together, just all the nonverbals and just learning how people, uh, you know, operate. Um, you know, see Jeanette was working in the glove box there. Alexander, that's out at Hawthorne uh, at SpaceX training. Um, all that time together, you really, it really means that you can just know what the other person is thinking, where their head's at, are they task saturated? Um, you know, do they want help? Do they not want help? Um, and that's kind of the the importance of all that of all that training, especially the T thirty eight. You really understand how. Uh, people function and process information in dynamic environments. We're now at T-minus three hours, 41 minutes until liftoff. And you can see kind of the, uh, kind of how they slouch a little bit, and that's, like I said, mm. because of the weight uh, on their head. So you, s you sort of like, like slump your shoulders a little bit to kind of take that, that discomfort off. Sure. Seems like they're taking pictures now. Yep, so probably getting pictures with some of the suit, suit team and the folks that will help in the closeout crew. So a lot of so that's Haley, uh, number 34 there. Um, so th several, many of these SpaceX folks are people they have worked with throughout their training flow. We've got the helicopter coming by here <laughs> to, to scout out the pad before they drive out this way. 
Uh, but yeah, a lot of these people, a lot of the reason they're taking some photos is this is the training team they've worked with. You mentioned how long for, you know, some of these people they've been working with for the last two years. Obviously, Raja knows a lot. That's why we have him here <laughs> with us today. So we want to invite those who are watching to participate in this broadcast. Uh, if you'd like to ask Raja a question over the next four and a half hours, just jump on X, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch and send your question using the hashtag AskNASA. Challenge him, guys. Let's see how much he really knows. <laughs> and we look forward to hearing Seeing from the, you. The khaki answering. coat, that's Norm Knight, uh, who's the head of the Flight Operations Directorate. Uh, you can see Shannon Walker in the blue suit there is the deputy chief of the astronaut office. And they're gathering around a table now because they're about to do a tradition that they do before they can leave crew quarters. Talk to us about what's happening here. Yeah, so it's a long-standing tradition. There's, there's many traditions uh, in, in space flight and aviation culture, this being one of them, but uh, basically playing a, a card game prior to going out to, to launch with the, the chief of the office. And the reason they do this is because... As you can see, it, it's Shannon playing the crew right now, and the commander has to lose, so that way the team gets their bad luck out of the way and can move on with good luck throughout the launch, right? Exactly, yep. High five. Uh, so it <laughs> so, seems like so it Matt... Went well. <laughs> I think Matt lost. And this card game, do we know what card game they were playing? I don't. It, uh, it's, it can change from crew to crew. It's uh, kind of based on the, the crew and the, the chief of the office. You see they're starting to clear out there. They're going to go prep for the, the walk down. Uh, this is also an opportunity um, they've, uh, you know, for any last minute updates that the chief has, if there was anything off nominal, that's the, also the opportunity to be able to talk through that. And we do want to thank, uh, thank the crew and the team for, for letting us show this this tradition you know this moment of levity before their flight which yep. as we know space flight is is risky it's hard so just to let us into these moments that you guys built in to sort of celebrate yep. the moment and yeah, this opportunity. I, think, I think the bigger piece of the tradition is the fact that the chief of the office is there so that that is no small task so i mentioned norm and shannon being in there they've had to be in quarantine this whole time and you can mm. imagine uh, in their roles, there's, and as we'll talk about later, there's not just this launch. I mean, this is what's happening tonight, but both those people are managing a whole lot of other space ops. And so it is a significant time commitment, but that's the importance of, uh, of human space flight. And so that, I think, is the bigger part of this tradition is the chief, the leadership, all being in quarantine with the crew. And you're absolutely right. It's, um, it can be stressful, um, but it's also a good time, if, if things go going fine, to enjoy some fun. Historic check the building here at Kennedy. Crew quarters is inside of this building. If you walk out the door, you see to the far upper left hand there around T minus three hours and twenty minutes, and then they will make their way to this caravan of Teslas here. There were three Teslas that we saw, Raja. Teslas two and three. <laughs> nah, we're, we're laughing because now we're getting to see so the, the, the reveal of how they're going to work the number into the, the license plate, which I didn't even know was a thing until I <laughs> until Darren told me on the Crew 3, or when I came out here for Crew 6 launch, and I had to go back and look at the Crew 3 license plate. But yes, so they always, the tradition is they work in the, the crew number into the license plate. Yeah, yay space. <laughs> and we have the eight hidden in there, as you said again, Raja. Before I remember, five, eight was I didn't know it was one, and that was, it would, uh, last time they told me that, I was like, oh, I never, I didn't even pay attention to the last got in the car. I do remember Crew 6, too. Crew 6 was Dragon, and it's the G6. So as we were saying, there are three Teslas here, second and third one. Seven will have the commander and the pilot, and the third Tesla will have the specialist. Outside here, Raja, I can hear you, you're giggling. I am. I have a bear. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see that there are folks that are waiting behind expansions. Let's tell folks who those are. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's a mix of expansion. Um, kind of outside here, you saw the flight docs of people who came out the door there earlier, and they're going to be following them. Um, and then the crew, their last chance, uh, they, you know, they have passes, any meds, they take anything like that. That's what's happening now before they walk. People down here are a mix of who've been in quarantine with them, so generally immediate family, and then sometimes there'll be extended family who weren't 
quarantine now behind behind the stanchion. So the people who were in quarantine will be able to go right up to them uh, behind the yellow lines, and then they'll go up to the cars once they're in the cars to basically um, say goodbye and good luck. And then they'll go down there um, to create some of these mass leadership. And I don't know if we'll be able to see it on the camera or not, but uh, that's the other, um, the other people that you'll generally see down there. Kind of the importance of, of all the leadership being able to come out and, and support, support the efforts. Yeah. And let's see what the clock reminds three hours and 35 minutes, a very well choreographed timeline that uh, the astronauts are sticking to right now. Uh, as Raja was saying before, a lot of pad is built in, so that's why you were seeing um, some moments there where they had time to take pictures uh, with their support staff. And right now they are waiting for a specific moment to walk out of the suit up room. And that will be at T minus three hours and 24 minutes, so about 10 minutes from now. And then they'll walk out of the doors again to the waiting Teslas, as well as family and friends who are there to see them before their launch off of this pad that yeah, we're getting be a the, beautiful yeah. aerial of. It might be the, the helicopter that just flew by. Again, a new Falcon 9 booster with and Dragon so the, Endeavor. The other, so there's a lot, like I said, lots of traditions in space flight and aviation, and you can kind of see around the door frame the stickers up there. Um, so below there's the big banner, and then below mm -hmm. that you can see those stickers. And so that's the other tradition is uh, some that, that's what they're showing right now. So you can see the, all the crews that have walked through those doors that have put their stickers on there. So um, somewhere along that door frame is, is crew eights. Yeah, specific to crew quarters and walking out the same hallway we're going to see out these same doors. This has been happening since Apollo 7 in 1968. So really steeped in history what these folks are about to do. Yep. Yeah, this is a, a it's a, a cool mix of uh, you know history and new. Um, I would think going you know going from the same suit up room that Apollo used and then going to ride the Tesla, <laughs> it's, it's a very you know it's a very cool contrast. And but uh, the tradition is there, and you can see crew eights at the bottom uh, right, just underneath crew sevens. Um, and so you, as you go up the top, the very top of the screen, you can see ours crew three. So just going down three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nice little line. Looks like we got two more left, and then we're gonna have to like skip around that little <laughs> handrail and keep going down. Isn't that a good problem to have, though? <laughs> <laughs> While we wait for again that hallway walk, let's kind of recap how the crew has spent their day so far. So they woke up at 11 a.m. Eastern time. They had breakfast, which is more like lunch. But again, when you're <laughs> when you're trying to keep to a particular schedule, you know you do have to shift things sometimes, right, Raja? Yep. So breakfast followed by a workout and of course they had some family time at around 4.30 p.m. Eastern. They ate another meal, then had medical checks and other flight day preps. And then finally they were briefed on the weather for a launch just before starting to suit up. And as you said before, Raja, weather is, is what we're really watching today. 40% go um, watching both weather at the launch site here, but also the ascent corridor. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned the, the sleep shifting. So actually, you know, one interesting thing inside crew quarters there, there's all the rooms have multiple sets of light switches um, because you can actually change the lighting to uh, either simulate, it's either really bright if it's in the middle of the night or do the opposite. Um, it is pretty common to be doing some amount of sleep shifting. And it's not just shifting for the launch, uh, which would be part of the part of the consideration, but the other consideration is when you show up to the space station, uh, they are on a time zone, they're on Zulu time, which is six hours ahead of central time, five hours hour ahead of here. Mm -hmm. So there's this balance and um, that's one of the things the flight docs are trying to figure out, especially when there's changes to the schedule or, you know, um, like what's the optimum way to do be a, a most awake for all the dynamic events and it's a blend of obviously for the launch you want to be very awake <laughs> but for the docking you want to be very awake uh, and then you want to be able to integrate into the space station as quickly as you can so it's kind of a, a blend of all those considerations um, and it has to do it's not always the same answer for every mission because each each launch is a little different with the orbital phasing and and how they do the rendezvous with the space station or the timing for that um, so it always varies just a little bit and the crew has been living in crew quarters now for about two weeks. Right, yep. So they go into a, a, a soft quarantine back in Houston um, and then and a hard quarantine in Houston. So the soft is basically um, starting to uh, withdraw in personal contact and then the hard is, as you would imagine, uh, full up 
quarantine. The families who you'll see come up to them here shortly, those people were in quarantine with them as well as the folks out the hand out a little bit more. You can see uh, some of the crew uh, down there. So the other people in the blue flight suits, you can see Jesse Watkins, I think it's Steve Bowen, maybe I can't tell in the dark, um, Jess Whitner and the flies. So they are the family escorts. So they're the people, they've also been in quarantine and then they're helping um, uh, with them. You can see the administrator Nelson there um, is facing us um, yep. with pumping his fist there, <laughs> talking to the families. Smile. Yeah, so the immediate families are in the fore front foreground of the shot, and then uh, you can see the NASA administrator, um, Jim Free, who's the senior civil servant at NASA, deputy administrator, and then uh, deputy administrator Pam Melroy. You can kind of just see the her head um, <laughs> to the right of uh, administrator Nelson. Now uh, let's take a social question. They're coming in. Yeah. All right. Let's see, we've got any ones like that. We have Santa Lynn on Instagram asking Do astronauts get to choose what their ultimate meal is on Earth before they go to the ISS. And I didn't yep. say final. I know, yeah. I saw that. <laughs> yeah, so we, we do call it your final meal. It's definitely not your final meal. Um, it's called your ultimate meal. And yeah, you do get to choose that. It works in crew quarters because you're in quarantine. You can't actually, you know, I mean, you can't go to the grocery store and get your own food. Um, so there's a food team that makes your food, and it also has to be um, checked and sanitized because you also don't want any uh, foodborne pathogens or diseases. After we've taken all this time and gotten all this far, you don't want to get sick from the food. Um, so they do a really great job of of doing that. And then one of the meals, um, of the ultimate meal, the crew, each crew member picks what they want, and it may be like. Um, and they could, I don't know where they I, they've got a very wide range of uh, skills across all kinds of cuisine. So pretty much anything you can make up, uh, think of, they can make. Um, and then the crew chooses usually when to do that, usually a day or two prior to the party. And I did find out what the ultimate oh, whales nice. were. You ready? Right. Right. I'm starting with the fact that Mike Barrett, and you'll see why okay. soon. But Mike wanted grilled salmon and veggies. Matt said, whatever Mike wanted. <laughs> <laughs> because he trusts his culinary expertise. Then we have uh, Jeanette had butter chicken. And then Alexander said, quote, nothing special. Uh, <laughs> just soup, meat, and veggies. A nice hearty meal. Very nice. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, we mentioned for Mike, for his, uh, his cooking ability, so not surprised to hear Matt went along with that. <laughs> He's quite the cooker himself. He's got like a stew he set up, which I didn't even know what that was. So I, hit it up. <laughs> I think he likes to make burrito tacos or special. Yeah. If so you saw the uh, the SpaceX folks have come out there. Um, uh, so that's me with uh, Kelly, who's um, helps with the astronaut office. Um, basically, the leads kind of this whole effort of fan support and all this choreography. So it's, uh, it's no small task, as you can imagine, trying to figure out the quarantine. Not you can see the stanch in there. So there's you see this family that are weren't in hard quarantine. That's the people who are on the other side of that mansion. Um, and the reason they're still separated because if there's uh, any kind of scrub or anything like that, then the crew will be coming back in the quarantine, and mm. it would not be so great if the families couldn't see them anymore, just because uh, potentially been contaminated by being around people who weren't in quarantine the whole time. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to contain all these these different areas. Um, and this is something we've been doing for decades. So there's nothing to do with COVID. this. Is all pre-COVID uh, protocols um, to, to prevent any pathogens, viruses, this is from being on board the station. Right. So this I'll is back inside hallway. crew quarters now. Yep. yep. So I'm assuming they're getting ready to start heading towards the uh, the elevator from out of the suit up room. That's right. So suit up room is at the yeah, end of for, this Yeah, for reference, yeah, exactly. Um, so down this hall and to your left is where the suit up room is. And then the quarters themselves are down through those double doors um, on the other side, basically they're like little hotel rooms looking things. Yeah, like basically crew quarters occupies like 26,000 square feet of the operations and checkout building, basically the entire third floor's west wing, because as you said, bedrooms, 23 bedrooms. Right. not the astronaut, bathroom. all the people, yeah. Right, exactly. So the soup room, as we've been looking into, um, but also, right, there's a kitchen, pantry, dining room, lounge, gym, two conference rooms, two laundry rooms, and a flight surgeon's office, three medical exam right. rooms. I mean, it's built for them to stay. Yeah, it's, it's an office and a home because if you're there for two weeks, 
you don't stop working. So all the people who are in quarantine with them are still doing their day jobs um, or night jobs if you're shifting. But mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the set up to basically be able to do all that, uh, from there. They even have you know conference rooms that have laptops. Yeah, countdown one. This time we are setting up launch test tonight due to elevator set. All right. Well, you just heard that call out announcing that we are standing down from this launch attempt tonight for elevated for winds, elevated winds like, yep. Raja, right? And we knew that might be a possibility. Weather has been an issue for us for the last couple of days. We were initially targeting Thursday night, Friday morning launch, and we stood down from that attempt because the weather specifically in the ascent corridor was not good. Very right. dicey. Yeah, that's where it can take the launch control and countdown. Ready. For awareness, proceeding with pause and clock now. Yeah, yeah copy all. We're set for an opportunity tomorrow. You heard that call out, pausing the countdown clock to reset for an attempt tomorrow. And I'm L sorry. LD is launch director. Uh, it can often be confusing, especially for family and guests who are here at the Cape as you're looking outside. Like, this looks fine. Why? Right. You know, there's not a cloud in the sky. Um, but as you mentioned, it's the ascent corridor. And so essentially you have to clear the entire eastern seaboard of the United States. Uh, specifically, what's really important is where the rocket stages, um, because those are dynamic events. And so you want to really, really make sure that uh, the winds and the waves are specifically what they're looking at. So yes. if the capsule uh, had to come back down uh, for any kind of off nominal situation, you want to make sure that there's not going to be problems because of the weather conditions along that ascent corridor. So that's the driving factor in the, in the case tonight, it sounds like. And then you heard okay. them say, pause the clock. Um, it's, uh, what that is, he's really directing them to do internal to the launch control centers, all the automation, all the commands and sequences that get sent to the rocket, they want to stop that um, because that's less, less things to have to undo to, to turn around for a launch attempt tomorrow evening, which I think is the, the plan. And, you know, some might be wondering, well, you know, launch was scheduled for 11.16 p.m. It's 7.52 p.m. Eastern. Why make this decision when we do have some time for maybe weather to improve? Yeah, so generally, um, if it's right on the edge, they'll sometimes go further along. Um, you heard, I think, uh, earlier uh, in the broadcast and, and probably saw online that originally they might take it all the way to an hour prior. And that hour is kind of a key point because that's when they decide to start loading propellant on the rocket. And once you... Once you do that, um, then it, you have to unload all the propellant. That's where you have to clear the area and things like that. So um, they'll typically take it that far if it's maybe right on the boundary. But if things are trending worse or pretty clearly out of limits, um, so on a lot of these things, it's not necessarily a totally black and white answer. There's mar you know some margins, so they may maybe say it's like green, yellow, red. But if it's, I, and I, I don't know, but you know if it's like yellow but going red and continuing to go worse, then that would be a decision. To, it's better just to stand down. Um, versus continuing to go further in the process. Because like I said, now you're, you're doing things like exercising valves, pressurizing lines, all that kind of stuff, that it's just better uh, to not have to undo all those things. It just makes it easier to turn everything around. Right, and there's a lot of coordination that goes to monitoring the ascent corridor. You know, obviously NASA and SpaceX teams are keeping a close eye on all those conditions you talked about. But we also engage um, the Department of Defense, right? right. We engage them um, in terms of actually recovering our astronauts. Yeah, so it's quite it's quite the choreography. So, I mean, just locally, the, the Space Force supports with the weather forecast and analysis, but you're, the bigger thing that you're alluding to is all up and down the eastern seaboard. There's units uh, on standby to help with recovery if there's anything uh, for both the, the rocket or the crew, if anything's off nominal. And so uh, all those uh, units have to be coordinated with and, and ready to go. And you can see, I think they're draining something. So they, just in the vein of like things that, you know, prep and stuff is happening. You can see at the bottom left there, some water coming out of the, uh, the acoustic tower. So that prop, I'm speculating, but that, that probably had some pressure in it. And now that they've paused the clock, they're, you know, releasing that pressure. Um, so all those kind of things, uh, you can imagine all that water that's coming out, you have to refill that water. So all those things have to happen um, after a scrub. So the earlier you can make that call, the less amount of those kind of things you have to go back and, and do. So what happens now? So obviously the crew was just informed that we're standing down from tonight's launch attempt. So what happens? What are like the standard operating procedures? It kind of depends on where along the point uh, you scrub. In this particular case, since they haven't actually gone out to the pad, uh, it should be a relatively quick, uh, basically they'll doff the suits, so go back to the suit up room with the suit team's help get out of the suits because uh, the last thing you want to do is rush to get out of them and, and then, you know, damage a suit. So they'll use the, the suit team to help 
uh, drop out of those. Um, and then they'll basically it'll be kind of like Groundhog Day. They'll uh, if there is anything in particular with their their flight mission profile. So for example, like if they have an upcoming EVA or maybe a really important science payload or some kind of robotic operation, they would probably use this time over the next 24 hours to maybe review that. Um, and then also probably start, so you know, that's that's one thing they could do. Um, and then it'll, they'll also probably start briefing and talking about what the rendezvous timeline is for this new window. Because like I said, it's, it's always different depending on the orbital phasing. So they'll pretty quickly here, if they haven't, my guess is they probably already do have a, mm -hmm. <laughs> already have thought through all this, or the mm -hmm. flight docs have. They'll kind of build a schedule like, okay, now that you're launching 23 hours later, this is your rendezvous timeline, and we need to sleep shift you, you know, two hours right or left or whatever it is. Um, and so that's probably the other thing that's happening is figuring out, you know, okay, you need to go to bed right now, or no, we need to stay up for a few hours and then go to bed and, and, and going through that kind of uh, drill. Um, but it, because they didn't come out to the pad, it's, it's much, uh, it, it is actually a lot easier on the crew. They are going to have the opportunity to get a lot more rest than they would otherwise, because if they'd come all the way out to the pad, got strapped in, you, basically everything you do, you have to undo. So this is, uh, at least for their timeline and their prep for tomorrow, probably the, a, a good scenario for them. And this is a live view of inside the white room, which is at the end of the crew access arm and their way into the Dragon spacecraft. Teams here are obviously doing things to secure and, and as you were saying, like really prep for tomorrow again, I'm, exactly. I'm assuming. Yeah, and the, I mean, the other thing, it's not just the people that the, the, the Endeavor's taking up there, it's also cargo, and part of that cargo is what's called powered cargo, and so some of the highest end science that's going to and from the space station is goes on Dragon vehicles because you can come, it come, come back down and then you can get uh, further analysis on the ground. But what that means is that you know once you get closer to launch, that power comes from internal power of the vehicle. It goes on to what we call um, dra dragons powering it or the vehicles powering it. Uh, but to keep it here overnight, it's going to go back on to umbilical power. So the pad and the ground support equipment will, will supply that. And in some cases, depending on what it is, I mean, there might be, you, if you can imagine if there's like human research type stuff or like tissue sample, that kind of stuff, you might actually offload it and then put it back on. And so again, all, all there's a whole bunch of stuff um, happening uh, beyond just what the crew is doing. And we were talking about sleep shifting and all that stuff. It doesn't just apply to the astronauts. It, it applies to this crew as well. Right. Yeah, everyone's, uh, the, the flight control team, both in Houston, uh, here at KSC, um, and at Hawthorne, everyone's going to basically shift to whatever, um, uh, to be ready for the next window. The good thing is that, as you said, family has remained in quarantine, so our astronauts will get some more family time before exactly. they. Yep. Yeah, and like like I mentioned, that's the 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 importance of staying in quarantine because now they can um, still have that time with their with their families. One last shot of Falcon Nine and Dragon Endeavor on launch pad uh, 39A here okay. at Kennedy Space Center. And I'll throw in Tom, Tom Marshburn to the rescue, send it was the crew three license plate uh. <laughs> with the E as a, a I was dying text. to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, one last shot of, uh, of what, of what will be crew eight's ride to space, just not tonight. Again, standing down for unfavorable weather. The teams now repositioning themselves for a launch attempt tomorrow, March 3rd, T0 liftoff time targeted for 10.53 p.m. Eastern time. And coverage, if you want to join us again, begins at 6.45 p.m. Eastern. We roped in Raja for I'll be, I'll be back. another so. attempt. He'll be back. So we hope you can join us then. For now, have a good night. Thank you so much for tuning in.